It's happening. <laughs> what is going on, fellas? What's, What's up, buddy? How you doing? This is ridiculous. You you've caught you've caught me in a regular morning. I've got my crazy board behind me. This is all I have to do today. This is it. That, you know, all good. Uh, Set that uh, up for today. That, that's just for today. That's today. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Look at this. You're you're two fisting your Tim Hortons, pouring one into the other, one straight vodka. What time is it over there? Ten fifteen. Yeah, man, we're ten fifteen, so this is easy for me. Seven fifteen over here. It's man. not bad. You guys are all bundled up. Like, uh, here's Michelle. She's gonna come say hi. Not oh. really. See? Hi. Look at these guys. Hi, Michelle. Oh, hey. Choo -choo. <laughs> Yes, they're, they're all awesome. bundled up, man. It's yeah, still right. winter over there, I guess. We are too. In the office. Just a chilly morning. So what are you guys doing today? We're planting like 42,000 raspberry plants. Oh, we crushing that's... grapes. What are we doing? Look at this guy's attitude right off the bat. Look at the hype. <laughs> so happy. I love that. That's the thing about you. You can always get a good personality out of him. That's good awesome. <laughs> it's, the, it's the same personality, good or bad. You just don't want to see it go dark side. That's uh, <laughs> that's when things go terribly wrong, man. Well, my name is Amir Man, and this is... I'm Gaurav Man. Today we have Hugh McPherson on our podcast, episode what, five? It's episode five. Episode five. So episode welcome to five. five. Lucky number five. I'm in it, man. This is this is happening. So, Hugh, what are you up to today? Sunflower Mastermind Groups. We've got those classes all this week. Um, so I got those going. I've got a top secret thing. I will I will let others know on the podcast. Did you know this was happening? <laughs> no. It's, this is that, it's too secret. It's the uh, that's the uh, event tsunami, which is our fill in the blank uh, marketing deal. So I'm working on that. And uh, I'm getting ready for the week, man. I got, uh, I don't, what do you guys use for planners? I got my high performance planner. It's orange because pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Didn't even see it coming. <laughs> and uh, I, oh, actually, I will, I will share this with you because you guys are super smart and, and hip and now. So uh, I was working on trying to figure out if there is a good way to do employee applications online that is at least quasi-legal and would not um, see I'm kind of old school so I want the applicants to walk the application into me because sure. that shows a lot more than uh, than oh look I applied for a job right yeah. you know uh, so I, I kind of am old school that way so uh, I don't know if I want to go completely online so I've just been filling out like a bunch of those services where they'll post a job and they'll do some stuff like indeed and uh, one two three form templates and you know just some other stuff just trying to see if there's yeah. an easy way to get at least that first thing because I like having a huge stack of applicants but I want to make sure that huge stack of applicants is um, at the very least pre-qualified enough to know that they're gonna have to do some work Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. 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 Yeah. That's my that's my thinking problem. I actually had to sit down to think about that. I'm standing now, but I had to sit down to oh, think yeah. about that today. So that's my sitting thinker today. Uh, when, when you said that you're planning your week and you know that board in the back before we started the podcast, you said, this yeah. is my week or this is my day and I'm getting ready and I'm planning it out. And you bought that planner out and you said, this is my orange planner. This is what I work off of. Is that what you do for the season as well? Being so, I don't know, maybe it's early for you, but it's early for us. Uh, but we're getting into Easter and Easter egg kind of stuff. But being April um, now, are you already planned for the year coming up? Do you have a lot of planning to do? Um, do you plan as you go? Is this something that you've already set out, you know, to, to like, this is exactly what I'm trying to hit for this year. Um, this is my structure. This is what I'm going to deviate to. How much flexibility do you have in that? Like, how much is planning important in regards to, you guys over there and what you do. We we actually did a bunch of that over uh, the December is like the the for us the, the easier month because we're we're uh, just open on the weekends and, and whatnot. So we did a couple of a couple of things in January. We did a number of really kind of sit everybody around the table. Um, we only do an hour at a time though because yeah. it's pretty intense. <laughs> so, uh, but what we came up with is um, we're only doing five things this year. Only five things. And so uh, at the home farm, so we'll just take the home farm. 
Um, so we're doing the Wineritaville Beach Party, which is the winery kickoff. Um, we're building a sand sand and band tent, Jimmy Buffett band, doing the you know the the buffet, uh, buy your drinks ahead, you know all that kind of stuff, and uh, having my class reunion party at the same time. Yeah. I got to get something out of those kids. <laughs> so uh, they um, so that's not that's number one. That's like winery kickoff. Boom. Okay. Then uh, second one is blooms and berries, and that's where we're experimenting if we can build our blueberry business. Uh, rebuild, I should say, our blueberry pick your own business uh, yes. by having some flowers in there. Yeah. Right? And uh, then Sunflower Festival is in August. So that's July. August is Sunflower Festival. Uh, September is Wine Your Way Out, and that's uh, wine tasting with other wineries in the corn maze. And then fall is fall. October is October. So uh, we don't need to do anything in October because it's already October. Yeah. And uh, so those are our five things. Okay. And that's created a really nice little filter. Um, my people have already yelled at me a couple times because I had too many ideas. And so they're like, we're not doing that because we're doing these things and we're going to do these things really well. And, uh, and so that's, that's kind of our filter for here that's for this talking. year. I understand. So you just, you, you guys are essentially meeting now based off of that structure and you're not deviating from that, I'm sure that you guys probably have flexibility within those areas, but that's essentially it. And when you, when you say, you know, home farm, how many of these projects, like, are you in charge of? Do you like, where does your life evolve around? Like how many buckets do you have? <laughs> I looked up some stuff online and you started Maze Quest 1997. Yep. Right? Um, you when I was your age. <laughs> 23, right? You guys are 23? Is that right? I'm 26. I'm 24. 24. Yeah, I, he looks a lot younger, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you graduated Penn State, right? Amir's and, and done worn out, and he wore himself out already. It's 20, 24 <laughs> years. Yeah. I got two cops, man. I got two cops. He's buddy. getting married, so I just told the world. Get so. married. Oh. What? I'm getting married next year. <laughs> Off the market, how is Canada going to live? Oh <laughs> I started when I was 23, back in 97. Yep. You graduated. Penn State. Agri, agri business degree. I, I'm almost using it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Yeah. A little bit. A little bit. Michelle was there from the start. Yeah, she, just, she was just temporary, going to watch the register every once in a while. Yeah, and then you met Dave at Walmart. <laughs> that was in 2000. That was in 2000. We picked him up at Walmart. That's right. Yeah, and he's a maze drawer. He does the yeah. He does the art, the cartoons, and all the maze designs. Yeah. Yeah, and then you your business is twofold. You do B two B, and you do B two C. Maze Quest, right? You got B two B. You have like 84, 84 customers. Yeah. 84, 84 farms, I think. Of corn maze clients, yep. And then uh, beyond that, kind of hayride audio systems and all the training programs and games that we design, all that kind of stuff in addition to the corn. Corn maze is like the pinnacle of the pyramid, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you, you service 650,000 guests. That, that's as of today? Well, the uh, no, that's, that's probably an old number, really. Um, yeah. We did we did the math. It's something like um, just because I was kind of curious, and and so we tried our best to kind of estimate our way backwards, and and we feel like a couple years ago, uh, our total farms, not my home farm. I wish my home farm did six hundred and fifty million guests. That, you know, that'd be great. But uh, no, I think the uh, what we figured is um, we basically there's been more than 10, 10 million people go through uh, the farms that we've helped over. Uh, over, over this kind of business uh, lifestyle. No, I was thinking it's bigger than that. 650,000 doesn't seem reasonable. 84 farms, right? Right. That's, right. that's a lot of farms, yeah. On your home farm, you guys have your own business and you're the winemaker, you're the maze master. Um, I guess Matt is involved as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We, you know, that, and that's kind of nice, right? So, so that, the winemaking in particular is a, is a team sport because um, it would probably be the thing that I personally know the least about. 
Yeah. So, uh, so we're trying to even get to where we have replicatable recipes of the things. We're not trying to make 32 kinds of wine. Yeah. We're just trying to make, we're trying to make like seven kinds real good every time we do it, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So that's uh, so that's a team sport, and we have a lot of local help for that too. We got another winemaker who just thinks we're like this adorable little pat on the head, funny kind of <laughs> little people, because um, he's six foot five. So uh, he, he thinks it's adorable, I think. And uh, and I he actually said to me, he said, you know, it's fun when you guys come over to bring me samples and like have me think about things and how to fix things that like I haven't made those mistakes for twenty years, and so. I just I don't even think about that stuff, and you guys are making me rethink all of that stuff I did when I was young. And for him, it's actually kind of energizing because he's going, "Oh yeah, right. I didn't even think about like how much SO two to put in." You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. New blood. Yeah, yeah. That's for sure. And then I scrolled all the way down on your Twitter, so it was like 2008, <laughs> and you you started podcast in 2009, I think. Right, you've been podcasting for a while. You still do that? <laughs> well, it's uh, I don't yeah, know. I've kind of done every. Yeah, his whole podcast. We're on your podcast right now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> your podcast, buddy. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I, I I invented podcasting back in 2008, um, right after I started Twitter, which was real nice. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> now, you know, I've tried each one of, and, and that's been kind of fun too, but I've tried each one of those things, um, yeah. every, every, everything. And, um, I, I don't know who your, who your target demographic is. Hopefully it's business, young business people, but eventually you have to pick, right? You have to pick the thing that's going to work or that works for your market or works for you personally. And, uh, to be honest, I don't have a lot of time for Twitter um, I, I've posted twice on Snapchat to like my own children and then deleted it because I just don't care. And maybe when you get old, like me, you know, eventually you don't care. Now yeah. for, us, for us, we have seen a shift now. Uh, I will say the last two years where, um, Facebook was just like ruling the entire roost for everything that we did. And then as it has progressed, um, we've worked a lot more towards Instagram. I don't personally do a lot of Instagramming, um, but in our business we do because winery, Instagram, flowers, completely built that festival on Instagram, um, right? So you kind of have to pick. And for us, Twitter just does nothing. Like if I spend a week on Twitter tweeting about twit, twat, twit, twitties, it, it just doesn't matter. Uh, you know, like nothing happens. So we post out on Instagram and like, after our festival, we were the top 1,100 pictures <laughs> when you did like hashtag sunflower festival yeah, yeah, yeah. for like a week until somebody else held a festival. We like, we had the top thousand spots. It was insane. Right. So you got to pick, you got to pick what works. And, uh, would I love to do a podcast? Yeah, but I'm not as hip and cool as you guys. So I'll just be a podcast guest and be hilarious and then make you guys do all the work, you know, formatting my podcast. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, let's 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 frame that then. So, like, in, in the essence, we there's been only five episodes, right? The first episode we sat down, we didn't know what the hell we wanted to talk about. We just knew that we wanted to try this, right? So we sat down, we had a conversation, and then um, this only happened because let's, one more step back. So I, I put an application out to hire somebody for marketing. The person sat down. His name is Jason. He started talking about podcasts and he's just so, so passionate about that, but he applied for a video center side of the gig, you know, because I was looking for a videographer and I said, wait, Jason, tell me more about this podcast and let's go deep into that. So we sat there for half an hour talking about podcasts at this interview. I'm like, dude, shit, I know I'm looking for someone for videography, but I'm more than happy to add on the podcast portion to our business to dedicate time towards that. And so we figured out some sort of structure and a pay structure for him. And we've recorded five podcasts, but I wouldn't have been able to do that without his help because in regards to like, look, you have the, the whole head set up, you have a mic in front of you. I needed someone's help to organize all that and do it for me. I'm sure I could have done it, but I just, I haven't done it in the past two years that I'm wanting to do this. So I just needed someone to really force me to get me there. So he helped me do that. And then when we sat down for that first episode, we just started talking about what we're doing in our day-to-day -day lives. And I just like thought of the idea, okay, let's talk about what we did in the past week. Let's talk about what we're doing for coming to because that's what kind of matters to us, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. If we start talking about coffee cups or uh, food or, I don't know, 
things which are side pieces not our daily life we've been able to keep this going as long as we are so now this podcast with the episode before this i had my mom on there actually this is not the question, I think. yeah we had our mom on here and we, we just talked about the farm and the farming history things that we didn't even know about where it's my mom but it just added this new level yeah. of depth into our business that we didn't know about yeah. and then just through this you know evolution over these five episodes we're like dude this podcast is perfect for now my family it's like something for somebody who's into agritourism i'm sure it's not like something which is gonna go massive like joe rogan or tim ferris which is so <laughs> <laughs> macro, right? Um, and we, we totally knew that coming into this is something that we wanted to try. But it is definitely something which is for people who are into farming, people who are into business around agriculture, yeah. people who are into experience-based business, you know? Yeah. And having people like you on here, which is helping so many people, um, has all these different buckets, has years of experience, I think it's just another level into agritourism, right? And so our plan is to have people like you on here, uh, Phil Quinn, Mark Sanders, anybody Saunders, Bill Ed, Backen, Bill Backen, anybody on here. <laughs> don't don't have Bill Backen on. <laughs> I mean, just, how how long? What's your target on this? Are you trying to for like nine hour podcasts or whatever? That guy talked forever. It's usually like an hour. Yeah. You can you can tell you, you can't stop him in an hour though. That's the problem. <laughs> you think I'm bad. Oh. <laughs> I know he just he's got a lot to talk about. <laughs> he sure does. He sure does. Yeah. He's a lot of he's a lot of sharing. A lot of sharing. Yeah. <laughs> um so then so I just, I really do want to understand exactly like how many spec or the buckets does does Hugh cover? You know? What does yeah. your life entail in regards to I got my kids, I got my family, these are the things that that I do. Um, I go to the gym. Obviously, these things are important to me because I think these are the things that people don't know about you, right? That they love yeah. to know about. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know that anybody's interested, but they can still know. It's fine. <laughs> no, so so I mean, you know, I know what you know, Tim Ferriss is probably one of our our co favorites, um, and uh, he always talks about like what's your what's your morning, yeah, you know, ritual. What what are the things that get you going in the morning and. Um, you know, I, I, I wake up, uh, make breakfast for the gang, uh, my kids and they're, they're both teenagers now and, uh, in high school and, uh, and my wife, then I go work out in the basement because we're not close to any gyms anywhere. So just work out in my basement cause I can just kind of roll downstairs. It's nice. Yeah. And, uh, then kids go off to school, Janine and I get to have breakfast together and, uh, and then out, out for the day. And, uh, when I get here, um, Particularly on Mondays, we I, I try to. Um, we're not quite. Uh, what do they call it? It's a. I think the ideal is a row, right? A results-oriented work environment, right? Where where nothing matters but the uh, but the results. And um, in general, I think I personally work better with people around as opposed to working remotely. And so um, my people are here, but their schedules are super flexible. Um, Basically, you know, they can kind of come and go as long as as long as things are getting done. Um, but I find it easier for me if people are here. Like Michelle's in my office. She asks, "What? What? Why can't I have my own office like like, like the other people?" I'm like, because I need you right there. <laughs> and uh, and you know, so but we've had to do. Um, you know, now now I've got Lo Logan's over there. He'll wave to you here. Let's see if we can see. It. Hi, Logan. Hey. There, it's right over there, and uh, so this is a non-secure environment. They, uh, but uh, he's kind of come on to do the uh, technical side of things, knock out campaigns, and manage the mastermind groups, all that kind of stuff. But um, what we'll generally do is come in and do all of that like morning schmutz stuff, and then about ten thirty, I always try to get a coffee, and uh, that's when. Uh, We'll get together and kind of figure out what are we doing for the whole week. And if we can get the, my business coach always said, John always says, uh, plan for Friday. What's got to happen by Friday to make this week a good week? And you do that on Monday, 
and then you can kind of then then you got a flywheel effect towards towards getting you know by Friday. So like last week, we were trying to get our tickets out, get our winery recruiting page up and running for getting more pourers in for that, uh, other classes and things that 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 we've got to get done. And so you know we plan all that Monday. That's what we'll do after this call. Is Michelle and I'll just figure out and I'll fill in my my planner where what's going where. We have a shared calendar we use. I you know I know you guys do all that kind of stuff too. So we kind of have that process. Uh, just to speak Canadian there briefly, that uh, that creates the the direction. Then in each one of those things, um, what we've tried to do is, um, for the most part, have Hugh interact with people as little as possible um, because <laughs> they don't need me, and it can be irritating if uh, if I like. I've really tried to get out of uh, direct management, so. Jenny's in charge of the fun park. She and I will work really hard to get our processes and our checklists and everything set up. What I want to have happen then is when we're open in the park for a Saturday or something like that, um, when I roll in there, they're started, like everything's ready to go. And I'm just there to be the, like the, the, the bolt of light and get everybody pumped. And then boom, we hit the ground running. I don't want to get the pedal carts out. I don't want to ask if the tires are full if the chains are on, right? All of that stuff is checklist, process, system. Jenny's going to check on all that kind of stuff. She's making sure everybody fills out all their stuff so that I don't have to wear that hat anymore. So a suggestion would be take everything that you possibly can and turn it into a system and get it out of your brain so that you can think about important stuff. Because, you know, my value is not is not doing those tasks. In fact, I'm really annoyed when I try to question. I gotta get I gotta interject real quick. Oh man, I got questions. Oh jeez. That's a good question. But like uh, when when you say that you have you have this one person in charge that takes care of your, your paddle carts, you know, or Jenny takes care of that that entire area, then obviously somebody underneath that takes care of the paddle carts. And maybe she does it. Who cares? But that's something that you used to do. Maybe a hundred years I ago. Open the park. Right. I would be up there walking around trying to make sure that, you know, 20 positions in the fun park are, are opened correctly and that the people are in the right spot. And yes, I used to try to do that. And I actually am bad at it. Yeah, no, you're probably great at it. But how did you take your mind and say, OK, this is a damn pedal cart. This is a racetrack. I need to in regards to, in regards to have successful, these things need to happen. Jenny, Jenny is the person to take that on. How did you, 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 you organize that in your mind? Organize that, that into something tangible that Jenny can see then? Because you know, it all lives up here. Hugh knows. End of the day, Hugh knows exactly what to do for that freaking thing. But how did you put that on a piece of paper for someone like Jenny to come on board and be like, you know, I'm confident that Jenny can take this on. Maybe she can't do it 100% to Hugh's ability, but you know, that's that's like, you know, ownerships or management's kind of ego speaking there or it's like that emotional side of things going on there but it's maybe that she can't do it to 100 percent ability but she can do it now i can go do other things so how did you organize that in your mind for somebody to come in and take that on right it's all it's all uh it's all one of these buddy it's all a little pen you gotta you gotta write everything down and so my my threshold's actually 80 percent if i can get something to 80 percent of if I were personally doing it and I had nothing else to do myself, right? Um, and some things like, you know, pedal carts and welding, like it's gotta be actually 140% of Hugh's ability because he does not have those abilities. But the, the key is, um, there's a there's a book, uh, there's a book out, um, Etul Gawande, it's the Checklist Manifesto. And uh, one of the things that, that he says in there is, uh, it is. You love that book already, but how do you, uh, spell, how do you spell that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not entirely sure I could spell your name, Rob. All right. So. <laughs> At two Columbia, what? Uh, well, but I'm pretty sure it's Etu Gawande. But it's the checklist manifesto. I know that part of it. Checklist manifesto. But checklist manifesto. But it's. Uh, but it, his point is that even brilliant surgeons, people entrusted with with you know like solving a problem inside your brain or like cracking your chest open and fixing your heart, they found that that um, with a simple checklist, the success rate 
uh, for brilliant sur you know, surgeons, uh, the success rate for that operating room went up by a ridiculous percent when they just used a simple checklist. The other interesting thing they found in those rooms is the success rate went up when they started writing the name of the person on their like scrub mask. So when, when the doctor looked up and was looking at, at uh, nurse XYZ, that the doctor could look, look up and say, Jim, anesthesiologist, or, or you know, Kathy, nurse, when they, when they saw their name, the, the, um, the quality went up again. So to me, if, if it's happening for people with jobs that critical, right, <laughs> and all I need you to do is make sure that the slide isn't dangerous <laughs> right yeah. in the morning. Um, so it's all checklists. And what I had to do was invest my time, heavy hours, my time up front at every position, writing down everything that would need to be on a checklist down to stupid steps like open drawer, <laughs> insert <laughs> money. Ones go on the right and 20s go on the left. You know, right? You know, like you have to do yeah, really, yeah, really yeah. basic stuff like that. And anything that's even mildly complicated that you can do with a picture, you do with a picture. So um, that's where you guys have to invest the time up front. But basically, you're just writing down everything. We actually have lists called What Should I Be Doing lists because yeah. I kept finding myself going up through the park and I would find kids who would be like leaning on the counter and they'd be like, I'm doing a great job. No yeah. customer is right here right now. And I would come up and I'd yell at them and I'd tell them, you got to do this, 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 this. I'd list off like 14 things that they would have to do. I would yeah. go off, they would be in tears and they could only remember three, two, and seven. And uh, yeah. like they were just praying I wouldn't come back. Yeah. Uh, and so what I did is I wrote down all 14 things and I made it a what should I be doing list. And that way when I walk up, I go, hey, pull out your list, what you got done? And they go, oh. and then... Okay, well, there's your list. I'll be back. Let's go check in later. I didn't have to get mad. I didn't have to remember. They didn't have to cry. And then yeah. when I came back, they'd go, "Oh, I got, I, 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 I did two, four, and, and seven. Am I okay? Right? You know, like, okay. Well, you know, try to get the other ones. Right? Yeah. But it's all, it's all just us investing. And I was mad, you know. And the, the crazy thing was, I was mad at them. Right? I was mad at them. And what the heck do they know? They're fourteen crying out loud. They have no That's idea what's right. going on. That's right. I, I was That's lucky they could find the gem mine. You know? yes. so, so it was my responsibility. And, mm -hmm. and that full accountability is, uh, is what you guys have to do and, and business owners have to do and say, have I done absolutely everything? Now, there might be people who eventually, like, they're, they're like, I'm not going to do that list. And they're like, well, you're not going to get to work here. <laughs> right? they, that's, and that's okay. Right? I don't even have to get mad when people leave now because they're just saying, like, you told me everything I needed to do, and now I'm telling you I don't want to do it. And like, okay, well. Accountability. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Off you go. It's not a, you know, I'm not mad at you. It just didn't work out. That's but, so good. Uh, Accountability. That's so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But it works awesome. in a winery. It works in the, you know, it works in the office. It works designing sure. mazes, you know, it, anywhere where we have a, a checklist. Michelle runs checklists. That's how she gets... 84 farms, their, their signs, their plexiglass, their design, their proofing, their game sheets, that you know, everything they need. I mean, if she didn't have a checklist, she'd be dead in the water and we'd be leaving people high and dry. A question I have. You were 23 when you started Maze Quest. Yes. Dead, right? What, what inspired you to go to B2B? Because um, when I look at B2B, that's where the, the cash is. You know, because companies... <laughs> Companies have money to spend versus a customer coming in the door. Yeah. They don't have the same budget, you know? Those larger clients. So, and you only need 10 clients to start or three clients to start, and you can sustain your business, and you focus on those clients, make sure they have value, right? And now you have 84 because you have those systems in place, right? Right. I so, do now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Before you just take that. So, yeah. <laughs> what, yeah there were a lot of tears beforehand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What inspired you as a university graduate to go B two B? Because like a lot of people want to do that, you know. Well, it, it's one of those things. I I think um, in, in anything when you have hindsight, you're like, ah, oh, that makes so much sense. Of course, you know. Back in the day, though, you have to remember, even on our home farm, uh, our marketing job was to tell people what a corn maze was, not like have them come to my farm. I mean, you guys have the benefit of growing up in, a, in an era when everyone knew what a corn maze was. 
We, yeah. we predate that, right? So it's a, different, it's a different marketing challenge. And so it may seem like, gosh, you were so strategic back in those days. But what really happened is in, 2000, in, in 98, um, we had an extension agent bring in a guy from Ohio, Andy Lind, from Lind Fruit Farm. You guys probably met Debbie and, and the yes. gang. Yes. And uh, so, so he brought Andy over and, it, you know, we were, we had like part of an afternoon, maybe two hours together. And I'm trying to tell him like how this worked and how to design. And he just kept saying like, I don't, how, how do you even draw this out? I don't, like, how would this even work? And would it work in Ohio and all that, you know? And I'm thinking, man, like, I, I can't, I can't teach him how to do it in two hours. There's just no way. Yeah, and yeah. Um, so he said, maybe you should come out. And I ended up going out to, uh, that was kind of fun. That was like my first business yeah. trip, right? Yeah. You know, where, where it's like just me and my little, my little, you know, backpack of stuff. And, um, you know, out to see a, a potential client. Cause I, I was like, well, you know, what I should do is I should just put this together. And yeah. then like, if I figure out how to do the design, then I can, you know, I can resell it to him and, um, you know, cut my cost in half. Right. You know, that'd be perfect. You know, very much co-op model. And, um, so we went, you know, so I went flying out there and it was just like a full half a day with the family. Right. You know, dad's like, this is ridiculous. And he's like, something's here. And no, like every once in a while, somebody else would get excited about something else. And then somebody else would be like, no, this is the stupidest idea. Right. Yeah. So it was just one of those like seminal moments where I was like, you know, it, in, in the end, I was like, well, here, here's the package. And if you want to do it, awesome. We'll be glad to help you. I got a plane flight, you know, yeah. well, I hope it works out. And so it did. And then 99, we helped our, you know, that was when we helped our first client. But it was, it was not a, it was not strategery. <laughs> it was simply... Um, yeah. We had a problem to solve, and I thought I could cut my cost in half, right? Yeah. And so we kind of just like solved this little problem, and then we started realizing, oh, well, like he didn't know how to do it, but this is working well for our farm. Other people are going to want to know how to do this, yeah. but they're not going to, right? They're not going to know how, and yeah. you can't teach them in two hours or in a one one hour session at NAFTMA, you know? Or, uh, it, it just you can't do it, and so that's kind of where that came from. And from there, like Hayride Audio Systems came because I couldn't be the Hayride driver. I actually like wore my voice out one day doing, you know, sequential Hayrides. And I was like, I, I, I can't do this anymore. And I need two wagons running. And yeah. now I have a problem. And I met a technical guy who was doing our radios. And I was like, is this even possible? And he's mm -hmm. like, well, yeah, I can build that. Right. And so, you know, all of them have been those little organic shifts. And I think the key there is just thinking about what problem are you solving? Yeah. It, for yourself. And then e even some of those, not all of them have legs to go be a problem that you can solve for other people. Right. I mean, it, we've killed a ton of problems, you know, a ton of products we've killed just because in the end, it, it didn't make sense to try to help people to solve it. But it's those organic fixes along the way that I think create the, um, well, but it's now it's, you know, Maze catalog right? You know, it's yeah, yeah, most value. And yeah. what, 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 you have a question? Well, it's up to your point. I mean, my mom told him here, like, he, he, he's in charge of the haunted corn maze, right? And he's like, you should go teach other farms to do that, right? Because that, that would add value, right? right. And then he was like, no, 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 I want to focus on the business, right? Yeah, so like, there's always question marks there. There's also, they're always because the, we're, we're young, right? And if you do that, you probably go to older farmers and tell them how to do things, and they might not be willing, you know? Um, <laughs> oh, I've never run into that. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you know how you guys are like the punk kids at NAFMA? That sure. was me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. In, the, in the 90s, right? I was like the adorable sidekick that would go to NAFMA. Oh, right. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. So it was, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I probably went to NAFMA when I was 23, 24. It's my yeah. first one. You guys have a head start. Oh, yeah. I oh, guess. Yeah, the first one, we were 22, maybe. I was 19. 22? No, you were 19? I, I was 19. I was 21 then. It's kind of sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, was that was nice. Oh, good. yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't drink then. Oh, I tried to eat. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's fair. Yeah. So that was good. Yeah. And then, how, how, how big have you, like, what's, you've scaled your business over the past, 10, 15 years to where now you're doing B2B and you're doing B2C with your home farm. You obviously have a lot of years left, right? And you have a trajectory moving forward. 
have, are you happy with where you are now? And if you're happy with where you are now, where do you kind of see yourself moving forward to, you know? Yeah. Um, well, uh, twofold. So at the home farm, I think what we've done um, the past couple of years is really bring a focus, kind of like I was saying, we only do five things. But even in those five things, they all make sense. So the, I, I, in a previous, <laughs> in another lifetime, from 2001 to 2007, we actually ran a wireless internet service provider where sure. we shot like high speed internet off of our grain bins and stuff. And that business was just tremendously distracting. I'd work all day and then I'd throw a ladder on the back of my truck and like go climb on somebody's roof and like hook up their internet. And uh, it was just bonkers. And so we, I know, like, you, you kind of squinch your head and go, what the heck are you talking about? Yeah. And so we found a buyer, and, and that was a really interesting process, um, a, a great time when you learn uh, what you email to people and what you say to people needs to be, like, two different kinds of things. Because yeah. I had my one partner send an email that, uh, that just about blew the whole thing up. Because it got forwarded to everybody, where a conversation it's real hard to forward. Oh, to the buyer of that company. <laughs> to the buyer, yeah. And I wrote emails because I got mad, right? You know, and I was young and foolish, and I got mad. And you know, you, you got to learn what which platform to write, and uh, especially dangerous now when you can just tweet crap out, right? You got to <laughs> be careful what you do. So that was real good. But one of the things it was doing is it was it was pulling me in two different directions. It was splitting my focus. Right. And so now um, what we've done is shed that business. And it was just such a relief. Like the next day I walked in, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm just the maze master now. Like, I don't have this other weird thing that, that, that pulls on me. So in the you know, so the, the wine's made out of our fruit. Right. The fruit that we don't ship, we do. You, we do pick your own. The pick your own that we don't use, we comes into the farm market. The farm market has a bakery. The bakery bakes for winery events. The bake, right? Everything just kind of spirals in and works together, yeah. and that has been just wonderful. Like even even uh, you know, Sunflower Festival, it's our wine, it's our field, it's our commercial equipment. Um, you, you know, we can use all of our tractors. All, all of it makes sense. You know. Yeah. For, um, you know, if we were doing like a fairy festival, it wouldn't make sense because we don't have any agricultural product that it centers around that would, that would do it. So we've kind of brought focus around those things. And that's um, my new favorite quote is, is uh, Jim Collins calls it the undisciplined pursuit of more. And uh, that's where you can just find yourself. Um, if you're successful in one thing, you say, well, I can be successful at anything, <laughs> right? I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll start a car dealership, you know, whatever. Like, it's just the weird stuff happens. And it's just because you're you're kind of chasing more instead of bringing focus around your things, right? You know, they say, uh, don't have all your eggs in one basket. And and the, the corollary to that is put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's where I think, you know, yes, you could very well go off and, and consult with people on um, haunting corn mazes. And, and you can do that as long as everything else is covered. It does still make sense. The better you do at your home one, the more people are willing to listen to you, um, you know, on the outside. But if you're, if you're dropping the ball here because you're trying to help people on the outside and you're not running, you know, you're not running solid at the home place, then you start to lose your own credibility, right? It yeah. kind of creates this downward spiral or it creates a virtuous uh, up, upward spiral, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, when you say having all the eggs in one basket, that's something common that I've I've recently heard, and and it's it's like I've, I've never really stuck onto that term, having all your eggs in multiple baskets. Obviously, diversification is good, you know. Doing different things on your own farm is good, but then like you're saying, having a car dealership or uh, investing in stocks or doing real estate on the side. Warren Buffett, you know, he does stock. He's a stock trader. At the core of it, he, he looks at companies and he trades them because he understands their value, right? Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't diversify his stock portfolio very much. He, he has a few main stocks that he sticks to, that he invests towards, or he's a few types of companies that he really looks at. Um, mm -hmm. Even with the other guy on, on Shark Tank, that, that guy that owns a freaking uh, basketball team. Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban, he says diversification is for <clears throat> dummies. This is exactly what Warren Buffett says. He diversification is for stupid people. People that don't know what they're doing in their day-to-day -day business, so they have to go and find other areas or other industries to focus their time on, hopefully thinking that their day-to-day -day business is going to fail. If it does fail, then they'll have something else to leverage on, you know, yeah. essentially. Right. And and so us, my brother and I, um, 
couple of podcasts ago, we talked about real estate, commercial investing. And that's something that we've kind of wanted to do, and I still do want to do. Um, but then, you know, I, I'll see ideas on Instagram, I'll go for a drive down the street, and I'll see, okay, this business is for sale. <laughs> or I'll see, oh, uh, my friends are doing a t-shirt company. But man, this shit see, makes so much sense to me. It's so easy. I, I've had some sort of, you know, um, successful areas of, of what I've done in the past few years. Now I feel like I'm built up and I can do these other things like you're saying. But this, this, me looking back at, you know, if I was your age, looking back at myself, I'm saying, shit, I can either take this one or two ways. I can stay focused into where I am right now and grow this up, you know, make this Man Farms entity larger. Or I could say, hey, Man Farms, I don't want to invest 100% of my time here anymore. I want to take that, you know, 17.5% or 25% somewhere else um, and invest it there. And maybe that will be successful, but then I'm losing percentage here, you know? And so why am I doing that? Is it because I think that this local area is, is Man Farms is not going to provide enough for me? Um, or is it because I think Man Farms is going to fail? I don't think Man Farms is going to fail, but I do want it to be bigger than I currently am, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And that's where, that's where I am right now in regards to what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I really want to, because like I spoke to the guy who owns Clover Me, um, do you Chris? know what Chris, mm -hmm. yeah. Chris Eamster. And we were just, you know, one of those nights, I think at the end of the national party where you kind of drink at someone's hotel room and you try to get kicked out. Um, and <laughs> we were actually doing that. And this was at uh, Cincinnati, no, not Cincinnati, Connecticut? Connecticut. Connecticut. Um, and and uh, he said, you know, you should do a pop-up farm. I'm like, a pop-up farm? What the hell are you talking about, a pop-up <laughs> farm, right? Like, the pumpkins just pop out of the ground? And, and that idea kind of just really rattled in my brain and it's been sitting there for a while and it's been, what, two years now, uh, to, to go somewhere and set up another man farm, or go up somewhere and set up another haunted farm maze. Because that's scaling the unscalable, right? And where is most of the reward? It's not doing something repeatedly, selling more coffees, more coffee, it's margin. But if you can take another uh, maze value, you can take another man farm to set it up somewhere else, in the world, obviously it'll be wildly, ridiculously difficult, right? Because all of a sudden I have to call myself or I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe I have to do a bunch of checklists like what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But the upside is massive, right? If I can figure out this, uh, there's obviously a bunch of areas in the world that don't have a maze valley. There's a bunch of areas in the world that don't have uh, man farms. a bunch of areas in the world that don't have Underwood family farm market, you know? And you can really take the knowledge that you have because we have intelligence in regards to what we're doing that nobody else has. It's because we're living what we're doing, right? It's not like something like you're saying. You have to go there and teach Andy step by step how to do it. It wasn't something that you were just, you know, able to launch a podcast over. It's this intelligence that nobody else has. So if you can go somewhere and really apply this knowledge that you currently have in this new market and be successful in it, shit, man, that's, that's something new, you know? Mm -hmm. So that, that's something that I really want to do, but I don't know. So it just, you know... <laughs> that come, comes back to what you're saying is that I didn't really know when I was younger in regards to where I'm investing my time. Um, and then afterwards, we brought everything into to your currently home farm and we're able to grow everything around that and everything works sy was sy syner 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 synergistically. <laughs> yeah, you got it, man. That's a big word, dude. So that, that, that is uh, maybe something where I really need to emphasize things on. But, you know, it's, it's, it's really helpful hearing that from you. Yeah, well, and, and the key is um, the, what we have that a lot of places don't have is we have a starting point and we have something that we can um, lock down the processes and the checklists and everything at Man Farms so that you don't start from zero at, a, uh, at another place. Um, and one of the things, you got to watch talking to Chris, though, um, because Chris is, is uh, especially, especially with the kids. Chris will uh, will kick you, and it worked. It made you think in a completely different way. Yeah. Um, some of the times he's he's serious. Some of the times he's seeing how far you'll uh, you'll fall for it. Um, yeah. But uh, <laughs> and and that's okay, right? It's a it's a mental exercise. But just uh, just <laughs> when I when, the last time I hung out with Chris, when I when I left him, he was going to go home and sell his farm and and like open up a carpet warehouse or something. <laughs> and then he, he called me the next week and he's doing something else, you know, so you got to be a little careful with that guy. But, uh, <laughs> but we can, we can do that and we can, we can do, we can lock down our own place 
And then the key is, can you, can you start to replace yourself? That's so nice. when I start to replace myself here, that lets me do some of my business to business stuff. I don't know that I need to go start a maple on farms anywhere else because I have that outreach portion of, of what I do. So in our trajectory, you know, on the, on the outreach business to business side of things, um, yeah, we want to sell more attractions and, and work with more farms and, and make them successful. You bet. Um, something that I really get a kick out of is the online um, classes and teaching and the masterminds and the coaching, that kind of stuff. My mom was a teacher, so I, I think I came by some of that genetically. And I just dig, I dig that, you know. I yeah. mean, I, I kind of like, like you, I, I kind of count my success by how many clients I have who are bigger than my home farm, yeah. right? Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I dig that. You, you say, well, why is an old farmer going to listen to me? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Why does, why does someone whose fall operation might be three to five times a multiple of my own farm's fall operation, why do, why do they have me do anything? Yeah. Right. You know, and the reason is it, it creates value, you know, and, and if if you were helping people do things or making it easy for them to expand or to add a business, um, you know, we've had a couple clients that have quit their their full time jobs because their their fall business has worked. Right. And, and that kind of stuff is is um, a rewarding part of my future trajectory. Right. You know, I want to make sure that we're we're helping as many people as possible with um, I, I think the one of the interesting things that I think we're on the beginning of the curve is the whole mastermind and coaching that just simply is not done in the farming community oh. business community it's everywhere yeah you know? yeah 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 for sure no yeah. no no big deal so I, I think that's an interesting trend um, it's kind of like uh, when when youth sport leagues came out and then all of a sudden uh, seven years later the high school has a state winning, t you know, basketball team or, you know, like my little tiny high school, um, after it was about eight years, we have, uh, we have collegiate, you know, D one school girls lacrosse because yeah. eight years ago, somebody started that course and yeah. they started getting better at getting better faster. Right. Yeah. And I think we're at the beginning of that curve where we're coaching and masterminding is coming into our businesses. And I think what we're going to see is the the better get better faster, and there's going to start to be a a, a widening gap between the uh, profitability of the of the top level operators. They're just at any level going to be more successful. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, you're so you obviously you you seem like you're pretty content in regards to where you guys are dealing with the business to business, right? And you're you're obviously adding value speaking highly about the people who you're dealing with on fall businesses at three times multiple of you. And now you're saying that you're on the cusp of mastermind and coaching. And when you say mastermind and coaching, are you talking about like life coach or are you talking about like one-to-one -one coach? Like what, what, is, what does that mean? You know, what, what does that mean in your eyes and how does that mean something for the client? Cause my, myself, I see people who are like life coaches, <laughs> I'm just like a freaking Ponzi scheme, you know, it looks like they're trying to sell you some snake oil, especially when they're freaking like 19, 20, and they say, you know, yeah. I'm a life coach, <laughs> it's life, like, you know. <laughs> you haven't done anything, that's right. Yeah, so, um, go ahead. To touch on that point, I remember in California, we're walking down, uh, what's, the, what's the street called? On the very end by the beach? Long Venice Beach, beach or, man. Venice Beach, Venice yeah. Venice Beach, right? Yes, you was there. And you mentioned what changed your life was a mentor. I still remember that. Like, yeah. You said you're like, what changed your life was a mentor. Like, that really put you over the top. So I think we're trying to touch on the same point. Like, sure. How did you uh, want to become that mentor from the mentor that you have? Like, you're adding value to someone else, right? So, yeah. yeah. What, are you, what, are you, what are you talking about in regards to this coaching? <laughs> What are yeah. you talking about? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's uh, it, it's just been an interesting process, and and my you know my kind of main story was uh, in 2015 was a classic time when I bit off more than I could chew. Right. We went from uh, no paperwork uh, to winery production, tasting, licensed product, and open by de you know the first week of December. In addition to doing all the other stuff that we were doing. 
and uh, and it nearly killed me. But the the thing that kind of helped me through that was um, was the mastermind group. Now, the coach was good. The other mastermind members, may, maybe um, I, I don't know that I had a real serious objective. I'm not sure they had a particularly real serious project or objective. What mastermind group are you talking about? It was a local mastermind group. Oh, okay. So, okay. Uh, so I, this was just in like the business community here. My coach had had uh, a mastermind group. That's how I found him. Was I was uh, looking uh, for? Him. I okay. got referred to him, joined the group, and for me, I took it super seriously. So every month, I had my homework done. I had something for them to evaluate. Um, it, if nobody else was too interested, I just would monopolize the time and have them work on yeah. all my stuff. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. I mean, if you're not ready, I'll take the time. Thanks. And um, and that process really really um, drove my personal accountability, and yeah. you know not just I have an idea, he's the idea guy, um, but drove me to really complete um, close the books, have something done. What did I accomplish that month, and really keep after it? And I think a lot of us get distracted by the day to day things that we have to do. I mean, I I know we've all had a day. I'm sure you guys have had a day. Where you're like, man, I am exhausted. I have been working all day, and then you think about it for about five minutes, and you can't figure out what the heck you actually did. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> all, all, every day. That's this every right day. Right? Did I move my right? All you know on the books. It's like, did I move my vision forward? And the answer is no. You did a bunch of crap today. You know, and some of it needs done. There's no doubt. I mean, yeah. Rob, you got to pump wine, man. You got to get it from yeah. tank to tank. You got to do some work. Uh -huh. You know, it's not all. It's not all fluffy stuff. And uh, but you know I would have the I would have a lot more of those days when I'm not using my planner and I'm not planning with Michelle and I'm not you know being strategic about that day to day stuff and then I you know when I have my monthly coaching meeting I don't want to walk in there with my crap not done and that's the that's the accountability level someone outside your business you guys know this outside your family yeah. right. And and not your employees because as well meaning as they are, and like I say, my employees will yell at me. They'll they'll tell me I'm wrong, they'll, which is great. We have a very good relationship in that in that respect. And I listen. They don't think I listen because I don't I don't look like I'm listening too much when it's happening. But I, I internalize it all, and uh, and I, I rely on it really. Um, but there's there's a need for that third party person that you respect outside of all of those positions, right? I work with my dad, and you know we. I have long-term employees and I have a lot of teenagers and whatever, but there's that third party person yeah. that, that you respect that, um, that you don't want to disappoint. And if I've told you I'm going to get this done and I'm going to get this product launched and I'm going to get this, um, event set up and whatnot, yeah. um, that's where coaching and masterminding, I think needs to make this, this transition into agritourism, um, and into our farms. And I think we need to, we, um, we we want to run them like a business and not like a not like a lifestyle family definitely um, uh, kind yeah. of kind of thing. So I think that's that transition that I think we're on the beginning edge of. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Is that where your boot camp comes in? Your boot camp? Well, it the the agritourism manager boot camp is very specific. So it's yeah. it's something that's more like a class. I'm going to teach you how to do it. I'm going to give you all the parts and pieces and papers and and yeah. templates and everything. I'm going to give it to you, deliver the course, right? Where, um, like our Sunflower Mastermind group, uh, we have content and we have an agenda and we are moving you in a very purposeful direction to your festival. But along the way, in that Mastermind group, that's where when you present your site plan for your festival, everybody looks at your site plan and they go, why is that there? Why is that there? Are you sure about that? I don't know if you can, right? Which way are the Sunflowers going to be facing? I mean, you know, everyone's working on it in a group environment. And that's the mastermind versus the direct coach. Like I have a direct business coach now um, who I go in and I present my stuff and what I'm doing. He gives me his feedback on that and holds me accountable to my specific things. Um, where the mastermind is the whole group is working on your stuff together. It's like a, a layer above, you know, it's cool because we all get to post out things like, hey, NAFMA group, what do you think about this? Which is really cool, and you get some feedback. Neat. Still up to you, like to go. Yeah, hundred percent. Do it. I mean, yeah. Phil's a nice guy, but he isn't going to call you up and be like, "Amir, how's goal four, five, and six going?" You know, yeah. he's not going to do that. 
you know, um, Bill's not going to call Rob, make sure he's making wine right. You know, that, it, it, it's like a layer above that. And you need this layer. And, uh, and I think this is the new, the new layer. That's a more purposeful and intentional um, working together, right? It's the mastermind concept. Yeah. So are you are you literally so coming back to the point of, of time management? Are you are you you're obviously trying to take this mastermind group and trying to take it off and, and to have more businesses invest their time into to your services. Then are you essentially figuring out how to spend more time less in your home group, time less in your boot camp, and then create more checklists than this? Like it, does this come and swallow everything over? Like what takes priority now? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's fun. I was uh, I just pulled this off of my my chart as well. This is um, kind of how we organize things, and I found it from uh, Joe Calhoun, who was at the a couple of anathemas ago. Um, but he had a really interesting way of thinking of things. There's objective strategies, priorities, and tasks. It's basically kind of how you work those things together, and. Um, and all of these things, again, kind of make sense with what we do, right? We try to make sure that even uh, when I'm spending time on, and a couple of times, you know, the gang's been like, dude, you spend a lot of time on this Sunflower yeah. Mastermind, right? And, uh, and yes, <laughs> I, I am, but anytime I spend time on that, like uh, I fixed my own site plan while I was in there. I, I presented for three of the classes and I go to the fourth, I'm like, wait a minute. I keep telling about this problem and I'm not sure I've solved this like site plan problem that we had last year. Yeah. So I'm going to fix it. Now they did it and then I could come back and I could fix it. So even for me, it's an accountability cycle on an event that we're doing anyway. Definitely. I'm not trying to teach them how to put on a car show, right? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I don't hold car shows, you know, but I'm, I'm working yeah. on my own festival at the same time. So, you know, our event tsunami marketing plan, we're marketing five events, right? So sure. the more I perfect that, the better I'm going to be at my home farm and simultaneously, right? So everything fits into that into that circle, right? Yeah. If I get really good at promoting events, my five events are going to be incredible, and I can teach other people at the same time and hold each other accountable along the way. You know what I would pay for you? I'd pay for like a phone call of me calling you and be like, "Listen, man, I'm thinking about the Sunflower Festival. Give me it in a nutshell. I want to know exactly what to do. Let me write it down, fam." That's it. That's, that's honestly all I need personally because you'll give me all the meat key points that I know I have enough ability to go and research that on my own, right? In regards to growing some flowers, there's probably millions of different topics and like how sure. to be sure. and what to do, right? Sure. In regards to um, line queuing, I can look that up. So you can you give me the breakdown, like listen, you're gonna have this many people, or you're gonna have issues in regards to planting your sunflowers or they should be this hot, this tall, or you should look at these seeds. And in my mind, I can figure out exactly like, okay, I can go this seed resource and I can look at these items because I know this is here. West Coast Seeds has all these dates on here. I can figure this out. I can do it all. And like, I can adapt, while I'm doing it myself, I can adapt it to my own um, climate, my, my own environment, my own changes. Whereas if I go to the like, Sunflower Boot Camp with you, you, it's gonna take me some time and I'm just not willing to invest time <laughs> to hear all like I'm not, I, I've been through enough schooling is what I'm trying to say to know <laughs> there's some key pieces that you take out of every teacher's mouth that just stick with you. Yeah. So I just want those hard facts. Give them to me right now. This is like what you're talking about. Like I just want the magic. You know, maybe it's my millennialness, me being young, the the I don't have the attention deficit. You know, maybe that's what it is. But I just want the hard facts. <laughs> I just don't want to sit in this damn class for freaking you know. Three Six hours. or seven or three or four hours. I just can't do it. I just, <laughs> okay. it's, I can't. It's not. That's me. okay, man. It's but okay. If I, if I call you and you charge me for that time and I have to ask those questions and it's real time right there, that's money. That's what I want. Personally, that's, <laughs> that's it, man. And like, I, okay, and th then I can get some support afterwards. You, I got some questions, bro. This is what it is. I text you. You get back to me within twenty four hours, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I get back to you in twenty four hours. You Log in and watch the site planning class. That's why we had it. <laughs> First customer right here. Accountability. 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 That's good. Right just, just hold your credit card up to the screen. We'll, we'll make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We'll screenshot it. Don't worry. I don't have a big 
Uh, I'm recording this whole thing right now, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, and that transfer of that transfer of information, it happens in different ways for different people. There's no doubt about it. And um, but I think that that um, think 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 for instance of how fast adult Easter egg hunts, for instance, um, blew through the NAFTMA system because oh, yeah. um, because information could get transferred, you know, so quickly, right? Um, that's not one that I do, so it's not one that I, you know, I could still hold a mastermind group on it because I'm great at facilitating, but I, you know, it's, it, it's one that you see pop through, but there are other things like zombie paintball that you see roll through and now pardon the pun, but it's all dead, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. but they, uh, you know, so, so you have to watch out too, that those, uh, you, you know, that, 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 that the, that joke <laughs> not to get up in all those fads. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Um, it, you say it's all dead. I agree with you, but then I disagree with you because there's no one here that does zombie paintball. Nobody in British Columbia does zombie paintball, bro. Nobody. If it were to come here, it'd take off. I think so. Per perhaps. Perhaps. Yeah. The, the key there is great additional attraction. But it's not a it's not a market mover, right? Yeah, a haunted yeah. house is an event to which you would go. A haunted corn maze, it, it is the event. Yeah. Uh, zombie paintball is a cool little like. Do you want fries with that? Here's my here's my extra fifteen dollars. You kind of plug it into the side of it, and uh, and and that kind of thing. So you have to watch too, because there were some people that opened up standalone zombie paintballs and put a ton of money in them and yeah. had a fifteen minute experience and a three hour wait and they're not there anymore. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. I remember yeah. on, on Aftema, like the the where you, like during the the time where you can see all the different businesses that you could add to your farm. Zombie people used to be there, and now it's not there anymore. Right? Yeah. Right. So I think that's what something you're saying. That's why it doesn't exist anymore. It didn't stick. Damn. Right. So I never thought about it from that perspective. You right. know, as you as you've been to so many more Aftemas than us. You can see these things rolling, and they're gone. Yeah, some things stay there all the time. Some things just roll in, and then they're gone. Yeah. You know, and yeah. that that's a level of experience that we just don't have. Yeah. Well, yeah. people ask all the time, "Are corn mazes going away?" And uh, right now, I would say they're kind of baked into the ethos of fall, right? You know, pumpkin patches didn't go away, right? I mean, pumpkin patches started maybe 15, 10, 15 years before corn mazes did. Did they? Did they go away? No, right? You know, it became its own uh, people moving event. Yeah. And I think that's the, uh, that's kind of, it'll be interesting to see with sunflowers, right? They yeah. could be a fad or they could become the thing you do in August. You know, it, it just depends on, on how the market responds to it. But yeah. like anything, right now, there's going to be a million of them and yeah. then it's going to contract because, uh, because not everybody is going to, is going to do it to the same level, to the same, ability to the same market area, right? Yeah, you know, exactly. Northern New Jersey is a lot different um, than Abbotsford, which is a lot different than rural Pennsylvania, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. so they're going to, they're going to blow up for a while and then they're going to contract and then the, the big ones will be left. Well, I, I, I definitely do agree with you in the essence of a fad and I haven't looked at it like that, but now when, when, when we were first planning this, I think it was in <laughs> December or, or, or January, um, they all ask, you know, are we going to do the daytime corn maze? Or like, no, they all ask, where are we going to put the sunflower maze? That's what everybody kept saying to me, right? Because I do the farming, so I, I lay out where everything goes. Let's get rid of the daytime corn maze. Let's just remove it all together, put the sunflower maze there, and then that's our, you know, main attraction in regards to daytime mazes. So that's our plan now is we're going to implement that sunflower corn maze or some fire maze exactly where the corn maze is, and that's going to be our daytime attraction. And so, but but the thing is, it's in August, and obviously those flowers only hang around for so long. And then my parents kept asking me, "Well, what are we going to do in October? What are we going to do in October?" And after I went to, um, I think it was Val, not Valas, uh, Lynn Villa Orchards. I think they do it, but they do um, the witches, the witches' house. So they go through the sunflowers to the witch's house and it's for a kids oriented attraction, right? So mm -hmm. my perspective, my thought, because I've grown sunflowers in the past here, they look ugly in September and October, right? They look disgusting. <laughs> yes. So that, 
that's an attraction on its own if you can make it for hundred. <laughs> If they're disgusting enough, if they're more willowed in and they're creeping, and then your graphics are around that, um, and your your marketing is around that, I feel like that could be like a from four o'clock or maybe five o'clock to like seven o'clock window where kids come and do trick or treat, or five to eight kids come and do trick or treat, and that seven to ten window is when you have the adults coming for your haunted, you know, because our, our haunted and then our sunflower are right next to each other. And so our haunted corn maze is not going anywhere. We we tripled our revenue from the year before. Um, it's something which which really um, our costs were one third of that. And so we had we made a lot of money on it. It was really successful. We had a lot of buzz. We got a lot of trouble from the city because of how busy we were, which is a good sign. Um, <laughs> and uh, so now now our, our moving our trajectory is to obviously do that bigger and better and add on ancillary activities like you said. But then our sunflower corn maze is right next to it. So the main thing was, you know, if we're getting rid of daytime corn mix, what the hell are kids going to do or what are we going to do for this time period, you know? And then I said, you know, let's, let's, let's add that on. So maybe that can, that, that's a way for that sunflower maze to be more of a staple and to take on uh, not that fad, fad presence, but more of a long-term presence. Or maybe that sunflower maze turns into like, I don't know, sorghum maze. I have no freaking clue. But like, it's going <laughs> to be Instagram oriented. It has to be. Mm -hmm. Like Sunflower Maze is an Instagram festival. If you think about yeah. these things, it's an Instagram festival. It's a it's a picture oriented festival. People want to come there for the damn picture. They don't care any, about anything else. They're, right when they show up, the girls are like, "That's it," you know, repeatedly over and over again. Mm -hmm. so that's 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 what it is, and that's kind of like where the mindset is. I don't know if it'll go away. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. But some yeah. not everybody has a Sunflower picture. Who knows? This is what you know. This is what we know. <laughs> I don't know if I know about it, but uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, and that and the culture around that is interesting. We were just at a modern art museum in, in Pittsburgh, and uh, you, you, there was a there was a wall at the end of a hallway that was just totally painted pink, straight over the window. It's just all pink, whatever. Yeah. And sure enough, every millennial group there just <laughs> taking their pictures yeah. and posing for their little Instagram things and. You know, all talking about, we got to do the foot shot. We got to do the, the sneaker thing. We got to do, the, you know, oh my gosh. It, it was kind of adorable and hilarious. And But in the end, it's kind of like shooting fish in a barrel, really. You know, it's just, yeah, it they're is. primed to do it. It's kind of like, you know, when you put in a coffee bar at your farm, you might as well charge four or five bucks for it because Starbucks has already trained the world to buy a four or five dollar coffee. Yeah. You know, they don't want it. They don't want a two dollar coffee. Oh, yeah. No, I don't. I, exactly. When I go and buy a coffee and I see this cheap styrofoam cup, I'm like, shit, I'm only paying 150 for that? Like, charge me four bucks, give me like a decent sized coffee. I don't care if the margin is the same, nor do I care if it's the same coffee. I just want to have that feeling of purchasing it. And being a little younger than you, I think what that kind of relates to is, is the likes, is that clout, C-L-O-U-T. I don't know if you've heard this term before, but clout, it's like um, you taking this picture, you're posting it on there so you can prove to your... Your followers or your friends or your your sure. fans it's something to talk about, you know? About I found somewhere in neat that you haven't found yet, buddy. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. So yo, I really appreciated that one term that you said it stuck with the R O W, your row. Uh -huh. oriented work. And so do you implement that on your day to day basis? Or is that something that you implement more on a macro or more on a Friday basis? Or what is that one week, you know, basis? Or how does that work? Yeah, it's uh, it, it's really just uh, I, I think when you have the right people around, um, you know, I, I I don't need to monitor Michelle. She needs to go run run out for take take the kids to the dentist. What what do I care, right? I mean, it actually costs me time and mental energy to try to manage that process more than, I, I know she's going to come in and do her work, right? You know, yeah. now if, I, if I didn't trust her to do her work, then yeah, I'd have to have like sign out procedures and like request off two weeks in advance and all this other kind of crap. But um, that just means I have the wrong person. Yeah, right? exactly. if, you know, exactly. uh, if Jenny, if Jenny needs to come in at, at 10 and leave and leave at six, instead of coming in at eight and leaving at four, do I care? No. You know, I mean, there's like that overhead. And I think sometimes you get too wrapped up in managing um, managing all those little details that you you end up wasting your own time. Yeah. Um, managing those processes. Same with the checklist. You know, it, when we're when when we this is the first sunny day. This is going to be like our first nice week that we're going to work outside. We're going to get to 
prune all the raspberries, start working on the bamboo maze renovation, and uh, and, and right, we're gonna walk out, we're gonna get some lists, get some plans, figure out how far we're gonna go in each kind of thing, and uh, you know, then we'll have some some goals for the week. Then you know, Jenny gets the people in she needs to get the job done by the end of the week. And they'll tell me if I'm being irrational about how yeah. much time is going to take, which I always am. Yeah. And that's, that's why, <laughs> that's why it's, you know, the 80% rule, but, um, but kind of eliminating that, that overhead of, um, I have to be in complete control of everyone at, at, at all times. Um, that just wastes your personal time in the end. It's kind of like, you know, there, there are times when I've had something on deadline and, I've had six people out there standing, waiting for the next thing to do, but my 15 minutes is still more important for me to stay here. I'll burn that much time just to get it done. And uh, one of the ways to kind of frame that was a couple of years ago. I, I even forget who it was, but they said basically take the take the gross dollars in your business and divide by 2,000 hours, which is what we should work if we actually work regular hours, right? Yeah. And uh, and you come up with a number that is a very big number. And then you start saying, is my time, you know, is what I'm doing now worth this per hour? Yeah. So we did things like um, Mich Michelle and, and Jenny have their own um, Discover Card sub-accounts for my Discover Card. I, I don't want to know. I, I don't want to go pick up paper at Sam's Club. I, I don't want to know that we're out of Sharpies. Yeah. I, I, I don't even want to know. And well, yeah. It all comes in on the statement. So what do I care? What are they going to do? Like go out to freaking dinner? No, no they're not going to do that. Or they're their own people. Right? Yeah. So yeah. the minute I started trusting them to do that, all of a sudden, all of this stuff just got unloaded from me. Yeah. You know, and, and, and we never ran out of paper again. Trust I mean, it's just simple stuff. Trust is great, right? But then again, how do you keep them accountable? Maybe that's an issue that you had initially, but now, you know, people have been around for so long to keep themselves accountable. Or is that something that you just trust your employees to do? You say, hey, listen, this is the deadlines. Keep yourself accountable. And you forget about it completely. Then they remind you? Or is that something that you have to remind them and say, hey, listen, you're supposed to get this done at this time. It never got done. Is that something that you do? Or like, what do you, how do you, where do you step in? Where is your communication in that, that area? Yeah, that, that's where we're doing our weekly, our weekly check-ins. And especially with these events, there are so many moving parts and details. Um, we started using Basecamp for managing the mastermind program and, access and um, questions and delivering content and making sure everybody has the right information. And um, that has turned into a pretty cost effective system for us for these events where we can essentially sit down at the table together and brainstorm everything out. Right. I always like to say I've got a lot of RAM, a gigantic processor and no hard drive. Right? <laughs> so, so when we're doing it, right, it's, it's go time. We're in the moment. We're writing things down. Actually, we'll have, we'll have five or six tablets and we'll assign each person. Um, they might be on food. They might be on parking. They might be on um, wine shipping container conversion. They might be on um, food and buffet or whatever. And then as we're all brainstorming things, We'll be like that list, that list, that list, and we'll, you know, there's like six people writing stuff down, so we can get it all out. We call it the detail dump, right? And we'll dump out all the details, and then we hand all those lists to Jenny. She puts them into Basecamp by uh, subject, and then um, I'll have e either Jenny and Janelle or, or Michelle and Janelle go through, and they'll assign the person and the date uh, by which those things should be done. And then we'll review that together. So I won't come back in until the final review. And generally, I'm just saying, is that enough time for you guys to get that done? They'll be like, yeah, we can do it. And yeah. uh, they're like, make sure you get your stuff done, Hugh. And uh, <laughs> right. So um, that's it. That, that way we can kind of track down through there and make sure that we're, that we're on task. And then when we have a meeting, we're not meet. I, what I hate is talking in the air when you just meet and you talk about a bunch of stuff and then you all leave and nothing. Oh, my it, God. Right. You don't know what happened, who, yeah. who account, who's accountable for what or whatever. That's we just go back to that list and we just go down through the list and we're like, not done, done, great, awesome, yes, no, on task, don't have to think about that right now, bang, bang, bang. Um, oops, we didn't add that. And, and that's, those, that's what those meetings become. So they're kind of shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter because yeah. you're not trying to figure out what to do. You're just making sure you're on track. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. 
that's really good. That's great. Um, I want to ask you one question. Going back to a little bit before, you, you said that um, Zam Hippo was a fad. You've been part of NAFTMA for a long time. How yeah. many years have you been part of NAFTMA? Uh, since 99, I think. Okay. 99 or 2000. Yeah. Five uh, years. Do you think that even within NAFTMA, there's, a, there's keeping up the Joneses? That everybody wants to do something that's no? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but like that can be a part of it. And it could be a fad. That's why you're thinking of it as a fad. But you've, you've certainly seen in those 20 years where there's been fads and there's been the things that stuck. Right? So I want, I want maybe you can go back and give us an example of something that was a fad. Everybody thought it would do really well. Um, <laughs> and why it didn't work out. Well, uh, more than more than fads and the the same ideas keeping up with the Joneses. I think the the other key is um, homogenization, and I, we definitely see uh, a lot of homogenization over the past, particularly t kind of ten years, right? And if you think about it, um, sometimes people will will use a euphemism like, "Oh, that looks like an aftema farm." And that just means they have uh, they have uh, apples, a farm market, a corn maze, a barrel train, a jumping pillow, um, uh, and and then like one neat thing that's different from everybody else's farm, but everything else is the same. Yeah. And and uh, and I think that's a danger um, because what everyone's trying to do is um, is bring certainty and clarity to an uncertain and unclear. Um, module, right? So, so people people are thinking, I, I want into this business. I think it's great. I know I'm going to get rich quick if I just open a corn maze. Um, how do I do it? Oh, there's the six things I need. I'm going to put in those six things, and then I'm going to I'm going to you know be popped out the other end of like the the Snozberry machine from from Dr. Seuss, and I'll have a perfect little entertainment farm. Yeah. That's what everybody thinks is going to happen. Oh, pop up shop, pop up farm, right there. Pop up that's farm. What, that's what Chris. Right? Yeah, and uh, and you know, order these six things, and you're going to be fine. And and there's a there's a big danger in that um, because the one thing that keeps us from not being every other uh, every other that last twist and touch of individualism. That's right. And there's a huge danger in um, neglecting the importance of uh, being authentic. And it's Early on, we, we kind of figured this out when we were designing corn mazes, and we would have people ask us questions like, oh, wait, does this mean that I have to be a Maze Quest and change my name to Maze Quest, kind of like McDonald's? And we said, oh, my gosh, no. Yeah. Don't. That's like the worst idea. You need to be you and, and you know, Jim Bob Family Farms, whatever it is. You need to be you, and we'll design the corn maze, but for heaven's sakes, don't become you know, a cookie cutter maze quest. And, and we've seen those cookie cutters um, around and you see them come in and you see them go out. Another fad that's really interesting and you, you might be old enough to know this one, but the, was the indoor inflatable bounce center, right? Um, that, was, that was super hip and amazing. It started like 15 years ago. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then for five years, um, they, th th it was just this, this interesting thing the next five years, there were two in every shopping center, and now it's hard to find one in a market area is, is kind of where it's down to. But, but everybody took their kid to the inflatable bounce center, and everybody thought, man, if I just bought six inflatable units and I rent a warehouse space and I have two party rooms, this is going to be the easiest way for me yeah. to make money, right? And yeah. there were franchisers out there, man, hawking it. You know, right. cracking at jungle gym gyms, and and I mean, there's there's a bunch of those inflatable franchise bounce yeah. today, bounce town, and whatever. And man, I'll sell you the franchise package. I'm going to get you in. You got to get into the ground floor. You know, all that kind of crap. That people For sure. Say, you know, and the same kind of thing. I think sometimes people get sold a bill of goods on all you need, 15 acres, and we can turn you into an entertainment farm. And um, I think what you're talking about is, is brand. You yeah. need to have your own brand, right? You need to be Maple Lawn Farms, or you need to be uh, what is it? What does Bill always say? Uh, Maze Valley. We make beer and wine fun, you know. And and every single video he does, you know, yeah. uh, where it's us, we embrace our culture in regards to our social media and our, our Facebook. We embrace our culture. We embrace the people that are working for us. You mean Canadian? Sorry. You mean Canada? 
Yeah, or, or Punjabi, being Punjabi and being Punjabi. Sikh. Yeah. Um, and then because there's not that many people out there, out there that are doing stuff that we do and being really family oriented, this yeah. guy's laughing. Um, but like, <laughs> but some, I, some, I hadn't noticed. I just look at you guys. I'm like, what's they're Canadians. That's, yeah. <laughs> well, that's all. That's all I see is Canada. Well, um, but like, yeah, you know, just just embracing that. And that's really that's really worked well for us in regards to making that connection with people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the family as well. And that's just really, really, you know, divided us with our competition. We have a direct farm. You know Apple Bar, you know mm -hmm. Lauren Tees. They're literally a three minute drive from here, like yeah. four minute drive right there, and they're massive. They do really, really good in fall, and that's just really separated us. Like we're the mans, that's the Apple Bar, and this we have goats, they have goats. We sell a commodity, right? They sell another commodity. It's just selling strawberries. Next to you know the strawberry farm. What what separates Maple Lawn? What separates Maple Lawn number two down the road is that the brand is the people behind it is who. Who they are, the identity of themselves. Sure, you guys all have corn bases, but why is your corn base different? That's exactly what I think you're trying to, to, to attach yourself with with this conversation. That's what I'm trying to get across. That's that's yeah. really it. Yeah. I have a yeah. question about the pay, unless you want to jump in. Well, I think what you touched on before is like diversification in terms of those bouncy fellows, in terms of like the paintball. Then that kind of comes back to like what Warren Buffett says: that don't be stupid. Like stick with the things that work. I mean, like our businesses, like corn maze, pumpkin yeah, yeah. that's what works. That's what you want to invest in, right? And you're working on a winery. I'm sure that's what you want to invest in. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, uh, maybe the Sunflower Festival is going to stick around for five years. Then it'll be 10, then it'll be five, then it'll be nine. Right? Maybe, those, it'll, be, maybe it'll be that stock that sure. sticks around and hits that market value that makes sure it keeps around. Right? But that kind of touches on that point. No, 100%. I think. For but sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Anything to add to that? Yeah, it's uh, uh, well, it's kind of like back to uh, John Shatler, who says in Destination Boot Camp, you know, what do you have that uh, nobody can get anywhere else uh, in the entire world, right? Yeah. And that's yeah. and that's the that's the differentiation, right? Whether it's yeah. the big honker donut that you know he was talking about from that bakery lady, um, yeah. and and it's uh, for for you guys, it, it, you know, it's your it's your heritage. You also have the wine that's a differentiator yeah. from your you know from your neighbors. And can they get an experience there? Uh, the haunt is, is a differentiator yeah, for you yeah. from your neighbors. Um, and for us, it's the um, it's the access to the stuff. Like we don't we don't uh, we we have pretty low barriers. If you come into the orchard, we're going to make sure you guys can can pick apples. We don't have them all roped off and crazy stuff. And sure. I, it just cracks me up when people are like, you know, the pick your own. Uh, we hate those people. They come in here and screw up our orchard and whatever. And I'm just like. Yeah. Cool. Send them to Maple Lawn Farms. I'm so sorry you've had such a bad experience. I'll take the hit for you. You know, because it, it's just part of of our mission. We're just very open to yeah. having people do that. When we have a sunflower festival, I let you cut them. Right. That's the one. Like we had this other complaint. They're like, Yeah, we love this guy's sunflower fields, and we just want to stop by. And they pull off the road. And there's no parking, and they don't let them pick them. How did you figure out how to pay your employees, Hugh? How do you figure out how to pay your employees now? And then how are you still keeping it fresh for them? Uh, it's it, it's a it's a super challenge, and it's not really one that translates very well. Just because every area is different, you know, northern New Jersey, Canada is different, um, New York State is different. Um, it, it, that that just gets you into kind of a quagmire of of apples and oranges. Sure. Um, so you just have to you have to find I think the right people in the right job, and if if it's not if the math isn't working out, then you've got to change. You, you've either got to change the business um, or change the the person, right? Um, so there again, that's where systems keep pushing down. How far uh, how far decisions and, and processes can can be made, uh, which will save you, and uh, and expanding the scope of what the top people can do. Right. So making sure that they're in, in charge of increasingly more valuable events, products, um, classes. Um, are you spreading the load over different business uh, organizations? I know you were talking about your social media person. Um, maybe you couldn't support that person simply on it on a uh, haunt show on a haunt, haunt trail basis. Yeah. But if you're spreading that over your pick your own, over your your market, your wine, your whatever, right? 
then, then you're able to better support that person. Right. So, you know, our, our social media girl, Janelle, is also the bookkeeper, also um, uh, taking care of eight streams worth of content that she's got to yeah. keep pushing out the door. Yeah. Um, she wine, she's, she also bottles, she pours at events, right? So, so it's creating, um, she was, she's worth it on the bookkeeping, but just being able to expand her, um, scope makes it more worthwhile or make year it round. Yeah. Right. So, so that's a, it's a, it's a real challenge. Um, you know, Michelle books, books all the groups and does all the, um, franchise ordering. So sure. if she only booked the groups, she wouldn't work all year long. Sure. Right. Yeah. But yeah because yeah. of the, because of that other business, we're spreading that load, um, in a completely different sector of, of the, of the revenue pie. Definitely. Are you, are you, paying, are you generally paying per hour or do you do the salary concept contract? How do you usually work it? Is it per, per job or how does it work? It, it's, it's per job with, with some incentives. Um, built into the different, um, you know, built in different places. The um, it, incentives are tough. Uh, if you read, um, I'm trying to think of where all of this stuff came from. There are too many business books in my head. Um, oh, Drive, Daniel Pink, Drive. Um, yeah. and, and there's an excellent, like, whiteboard explainer. Sure. So, so since you have a very limited attention span, you I can watch like a five minute, you know, little little YouTube video on it. Um, but you have to be very careful what you incentivize. You know, one of his one of his big studies is when they paid kids to get good grades. Um, the kid would never get a good grade unless they knew they were going to get paid after that. Like yeah. they totally you totally screw people up. Yeah. Uh, with that, so there again, I think that's why it's more important to just just make sure the right person's in the in the right position yeah. and then they they will make themselves uh they, yeah. they'll find ways to create value uh, when you're initially bringing up you know um these these employees that now you have that that matters a lot of your time right did you did you know that you kind of just wanted these positions beforehand or did they just kind of develop on their own you're, you're like oh shit like this is taking up a lot of my time maybe michelle can take this on or maybe jenny can take this on whoever it is you know um and that can kind of happen or were you like Hmm. For me to grow at Maple Lawn Farms, I need this person, so I'm going to go hire this person. Yeah, the 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 Fun Park one was one that um, essentially kind of just it, it was one that spiraled out of control, and I wasn't able to get anything done, so I had to kind of move somebody into that position. Um, so so that was one where we actually really defined that the the bookkeeper position was one where I I had. Um, I had a lady who'd been with us for years and years. She retired. Um, we did a little bit better when I hired the next person in there, um, yeah. who was burned out of corporate America. Just wanted a couple days a week. She she was great for a while, but then when we found Janelle, that's when we actually like wrote a job description because yeah. um, we had finally learned to do that. And yeah. uh, and now the big joke is, you know, every every week I just go in and add a couple more lines to her job description. And uh, and it, I and she's on she's still only in two days a week so and I recommended. it works out purpose. And I recommended her. Oh, and Michelle recommended her, right? So <laughs> she gets full credit. No, no, no but find for, the people that are worth your time. Right, right. But so so yeah, I mean, so what she's alluding to there is our our recruiting concept, which is called the rebuilding team, and that's where you know the team can kind of do some pre qualification for you. Um, that was a skill position, right? That was one where you had. To, you had to do QuickBooks. You had to have, um, you know, accounting background or at least bookkeeping background, yeah. and uh, had to be already good at, at, at social media. I, I wasn't going to teach you how to use your phone, right? Yeah. So <laughs> you know, so that that was a that was kind of the, a skill position that we very specifically created and wrote that job description for. But a lot of times, what you'll find is things will spiral out of control, and you'll realize you're not getting anything done because you're doing too many tasks. Yeah, and that's when you have to kind of split that one off. Bob, Bob Ricky is one of the ones that did an interesting thing. Have you heard of his Fab Five? No. Um, that would be, he would be a good one to have on and talk about the Fab Five concept, which is basically he had someone who had worked with him and been a manager, you know, kind of top level uh, team position. And when that person left, instead of hiring a full-time person, they hired five part-time 
moms who could who were interested in that results oriented workplace had wildly different crazy schedules and uh, what he's found now, I think they, they've been there a full season, not a full year, but a full season. And he's getting two to three persons worth of work out of these five people that really just replaced kind of one full time person. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that would be a real interesting conversation to have with him about that. Well, um, I'm really I'm really thinking like personally in regards to social media, like have you heard of the term perfect storm? Like I got this from a local entrepreneur. Um, he, we actually grew up with him, and then now he sells backpacks and Kickstarter for a living. He's in New York, but he said you can't find a perfect storm employee. It's really freaking difficult. Maybe you'll find one over a hundred, you know. And I feel like you know sometimes I found that person, but then they let me down, and that's just the kind of the expectations that I have. So like it's that's just me learning, you know, how to be a better manager. So like, you know, like you're saying, find these right people to figure these right skills out and do these right jobs. And maybe those people can then take on other skills or add those on. And then that now you have, say, marketing per se, uh, there's photography, videography, graphic design. There's the social media management as well that goes into it. So maybe you, fi- you first find a good photographer. They come out for, you know, you batch all your photography into two days. So they come out for those two days and do all that work. But then that photographer is like, shit, you know, I can edit this and I'll put some text overlays and I'll do some design work. Now all of a sudden this photographer has become your designer and now mm-hmm. this one person's worth of work has been two persons worth of work, but it's still within that period of one person, you know? And I think that maybe that's what you're alluding to there. Yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, and for him, even if one of the Fab Five uh, gets a full-time job, kid graduates, they get a full-time job or whatever, he's still got four people who know what the other fifth person did and he's had a lot less uh, shit. Um, he, challenge to to uh you know and of course that would only ever happen on like september 15th right? yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know and so um, yeah so but he has to be flexible with all of their schedules all of their kids activities all their whatevers and, and bob's kind of super awesome about that sarah's you know pretty amazing about that too but they they have a system in place where they're keeping those those five people accountable for getting things done right Sure. Bob and Sarah have to be absolutely 100% on it sure. or those five people will be floundering wondering if yeah. they're doing the right things or whatever. Sure. So that you know it's a it's a challenge but it's one that's you know I mean Michelle worked through two pregnancies, right? Yeah. She worked at home, yeah. she would get it. Yeah. I mean you know and and she was right. getting her work done. So what do I care? Right? Yeah. You know, exactly. I'm not going to say like you have to pay for child care or you can't come to yes. No. But that doesn't even make sense, you know. Yeah. No, but uh, cool. yeah, so something to think about. Um, he would be a good one to to really talk about that. I'm relaying the secondhand story of how things right, but he would he would be a much better uh, interview sure. to talk uh, about that. Uh, um, our biggest challenge as a winery is education, because everybody knows red and white, but no one knows fruit, right? Because yep. I was I was interviewing uh, a potential employee to handle a regional job in a different area. Um, like there's the Fraser Valley, there's Vancouver Island. I'm trying to get her to manage Vancouver Island, um, but I asked her what's her biggest competition, and she was listing off all these other local fruit wineries. But her biggest competition is actually other grape wines. Sure. No Reds one, and whites, man. Go ahead. Reds but, and whites, yeah, sure, yeah, it is. Right. So and then um, the market is very price sensitive too. So you got to be like, okay, my wine is twenty five dollars. So people were looking for a medium price wine won't, won't want to purchase a $25 wine unless they have the education and they tried it before. Right. right? So how, like, is that your biggest challenge? Is that the way you're looking at it versus what I'm looking at it or? Because- um, I, I, location is really our biggest challenge location and, and uh, Pennsylvania wine distribution laws. Um, so I would say right now, and I, I'm probably not even qualified to speak with you about wine making, but the, uh, the, um, if, if right now our winery is kind of like an event winery, so we've got our products and we've got them, you know, during our season here, our seasonal winery at the tasting room. Yeah. Um, and then for any one of our events, it'll put a nice little, uh, a, a nice little boost on whenever we sell wine at those events. So, uh, so for us, we figured that different was better than better, which is Sally Hogshead. She's one of my favorites. Um, but different is better than better. And that's why we did the fruit wines. 
And the guy who helps us is a red and white guy. And so that I think is part of the reason why he doesn't care that we <laughs> we're doing anything because we're so small and we're, yeah. we're the weirdo fruit guys. And so he'll help us figure out how to do it. Um, so for us, I don't think it's the same problem yet. I think, yes, you've identified reds and whites. Um, might, might be the, because of your price point, they might be the, the, the place to target. Um, I don't know that, you know, you can't beat margin in the glass either. So, you, you know, you need that distribute. What we are lacking now is pallet size distribution that keeps our tanks turning. And, uh, and we're going to have to just come off our high horse a little bit and, and take a little, a lower margin just to run it out through the Pennsylvania distribution system so that we can have some volume through the system as we're, as we're making wine. Otherwise it's going to stay kind of a hobby and event winery and it will rise and fall with the quality and weather, uh, of our events. Yeah. So, you know, last year we had terrible weather, so everything came down, right? All of our winery volume came down because it was completely dependent on people attending our farm. Yeah. So our bigger challenge now is getting out into distribution and, uh, and making sure that, that we've got enough volume through the system. Then maybe we'll run into a problem like you're having, which is, um, is it a price point? Is it an education? Um, uh, and there I would say it might even be that what you need to do is, um, is evented out and maybe her, maybe her job would be holding wine tastings, more wine tastings at, um, specifically at uh, liquor stores where people are going to be buying or wine stores, whatever um, you guys have out there to introduce people to the product, right? And uh, if you're finding that that on-site tasting starts sending the sales per store, um, you know, up the hockey stick, then you know it's going to be worth that person doing that. And if you do it enough times, if you just put her on a circuit, every every month you're at a different store or twice a month you're at a different store. And and eventually, you know, if you do that for a year, you're, you're probably going to have done your job. That's right. right. That's yeah. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah, I know. Um, this past November and December, I really wanted to kick wine tastings in the last per se. And we did uh, over 100 wine tastings, uh, probably November and December. The second wow. November to the end of December, um, like the last weekend before Christmas, I had 20 people per day doing tw uh, 20 at uh, 20 different locations in wine tastings. It's crazy, right? And, so and that, did it? So did it work? So you already have the the uh, figures. Did it work? 100 percent. Like the way that it worked, sure, we sold wine in the spot and those stores ordered, but we also got organic growth in January, February, and March. Yeah. Right. So those customers kept coming back. Yeah, tried it. And then um, now it's late spring. I haven't done very many tastings, but I know it's late spring or in summer. Our wine is a fruit winery, so I'm gonna schedule those tastings, get those people involved. Like yeah. I'm hiring specifically for people to do wine tastings on weekends. And I'm hiring a retailer for like different cities. So I'm trying to hire those people to do tastings at those stores. And sure, we're in 140 stores. But the thing you have to remember is you have to focus on the right stores. Right. customers shop at those stores and they might shop at different stores so if they see that product in one store that's where they always shop then maybe they're busy they got to go to a specific store and they'll know our product and they'll buy it right? yeah so um, these are stores in which you already have product you're not yeah. trying to get product in that store and if you leave then they're they'll be able to buy repeatedly at those stores 100 um the honestly the easy part is getting a wine in those stores for us at least? I don't know how your distribution works because all I did was go to a liquor store, I set up a meeting, got the manager tried the product, and they brought in the wine. But the hardest part is getting the customer to buy it off the shelf. Right. So that's do the wine tastings, right? So that's where the education comes in because the customer doesn't know the product. They purchase red or white between the price of $12 and $20, and we're selling a fruit wine that's $23. Why would they buy our product versus other products, right? So, right. so my, my mind, my mind thinks like this. Like, so if this is if, if this works for for Gorov, right? Yeah. My mind works like this. Like, okay, people are walking into wine stores. They're looking at this this gentleman or this female standing there. Hopefully, it's it's an attractive person because that always sells. Yeah. And then uh, <laughs> they're. I'm gonna I, have to hire it out. I guess I'm gonna have to hire it out. <laughs> it, it has to be an attractive display. Right now, my brother, all he has is a table with a tablecloth, a bucket of ice, and some wine sitting in it. Right. 
So my thing is like, okay, let's let's get this display attractive. If it's like a cardboard facade or if it's something which is re replicatable, which is not too expensive, maybe it has some lights on it. Um, the person has something kind of attractive, you know, get them there. Um, number one. Number two is there should be a social media campaign that is going it coinciding with the graphics that people see when they walk in to that liquor store because it, 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 it triggers that like, yo, I've seen it online. I'm seeing it in person. I should go try this. Or I've seen it here. Oh, wow, I'm reminded about it online. I should go buy this. You know, either back and forth. Then number three is we need to get our wine in influencers, in the hand of influencers that are local within that area, within that liquor store. You like know? Snoop Dogg. Sure, exactly. <laughs> like not like Snoop Dogg, probably, probably a little less than that. But something, something, those three things, trifecta, could be a solid marketing strategy for the wine for it to take off. You know, so this is this is what my mind's wrapping around. So now, Hugh, my challenge with this is got an idea, right? Now I want to execute this. Who do I delegate to do this? You know, this is my this is the main issue that I've been running into for the past year. This is what I'm trying to conquer for this year is to figure out these people who I can put in this position, pay them enough, create enough checklists, make accountability, set these expectations up for them to take these things on. Yeah, I, well, and and it's it's some of what we had said before, right? So how do you differentiate your wine tasting? From something else, how do you how do you have a booth that's so interesting and uh, and clever that people want to take their selfie uh, while they're at your booth, or you let them step behind their booth and gotcha. and you know or whatever and and do it. All, all of that booth stuff though is pretty inexpensive. I mean, you pretty much could make it out of core plast and fold yeah. down, right? But um, but what is uniquely you that makes it completely different from? Um, any other wine tasting that that's yeah. going to be in there. So what what says your farm? Is it the red barn? Is it the 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 fruity wines? Is it uh, get fruity with man's? Is it you know whatever whatever that that branding is? Um, then 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 try to think Instagrammable. How can I right? If, you know you don't want to have people sign up for something or do whatever. You just want them to snap a picture and and hashtag you on uh, you know on on Instagram. So you're standing there anyway. It's really not that. It, can you make it? You have to be thinking. All right. Could a could a twenty something uh, year old girl who weighs 105 pounds um, take this take this display in and only make one extra trip to her car and then do the still do the tasting? Right? Can it not? Can it not be? Because you don't want your people getting there and like, oh man, I used to do these wine tastings for her, but now it's such a hassle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But you kind of want it to like roll in there, hit the button, turn on the lights, and the stuff yeah. comes on, and yeah. and and it's like, how can you make it magical for them? I would say a good a good sign shop with a good designer is probably where you want to go. Um, but sketch out sketch out the idea. The key for you guys is what's what's so man farms and so cool that no one's ever going to see in a wine shop. Yeah. Only when you guys get there, and and simple enough that it that I can get my picture in it. No, for sure, definitely. Instagram. Um, yeah, one thing I want to mention. I don't know if you're having this issue, but what I realized a little while ago was that 95% um, of consumers don't know their wine. They know nothing about wine. Um, and I was trying to like figure out the right person to do a wine tasting. And then I realized anybody can do a wine tasting if they know two or three facts about the wine. And then they become an expert. Right? When I was doing tastings in November and December, I was able to do those 20 tastings per day because they were teenagers, like 19 years old, which is our drinking age, and like early 20 somethings. But like I sat them down, like 95% of people are gonna walk in, know nothing about wine, yeah. and they know those two or three facts about wine, they're gonna be seen as an expert. And they sure. tried the wine and sure that they like the wine, and that made a big difference. So maybe that's something you should consider. I don't know if that's an issue that you're yeah. having hiring the right person for the tasting bar. Uh, you might want to get their education, but I don't think you necessarily need that, right? So, right. I mean, but I uh, need to, right? But we need to provide that education, is what you're saying, oh, right? 100%. And it doesn't have to be about everything in the process. Just give yeah. me the, give me the sound bite, right? Amir doesn't have much time to think about much, so that's he, right. He, exactly. he just wants his little sound bites. It's going to make him sound smart in front of his lady, and uh, then, <laughs> then that's all he's got to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank thank you, Hugh, for, yeah. for being on, man. I really appreciate your time. All right. Where yeah. where's this going? Well, okay. So this is what this is what we have. I want to ask, but like, 
Okay. <laughs> From what you had with us, our experience, right? Uh, what should I name Who do you think would get value out of this? Um, I think we did. I mean, you yeah. can just email it to me. Yeah, for sure. I, I feel like I thought about some stuff. I did too. I feel like I learned a lot. Yeah, of course you did. I feel like I just went through a boot camp with you. <laughs> you did. You did. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, you're two young business people. Um, I think young business people, I think, are will find that interesting. Um, we, we're, we're uh, Americans and Canadians getting along well together. So I think, you know, it's both sides of the, uh, both sides of the border. Uh, there's no wall between us. It's great. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I mean, national might get a kick out of it. Um, I don't think I insulted anyone too much other than Chris, which is fine. He's, he's more than big enough to handle it. Um, but Bill. yeah, I, I, Bill. Yeah. Well, he's, He's my doppelganger. That's like the joke. All I need to do is grow up. Like in three days, I could impersonate Bill back into the point where I'm not entirely sure Michelle would know the difference. Next Nathema, you guys should come dressed up together. Exact same place. Just boom, get my goatee on. Yes. And, then, and then just trade name tags. Yes. And, uh, and really freak people out. They're like, wow. They'll say things like, wow, Hugh, you really look like you've aged poorly this past year. And then they'll say things like, Bill, you look amazing. How did you do it? <laughs> oh, and, uh, yeah, you know, stuff like that. Um, well, I think Aftermath might like it. I think that a lot of people, I, I, don't, I don't really care, to be honest, who might really like it. I just, I got a lot of value of speaking 100%, to you. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Like, I learned a shit ton. Yeah. I've always wanted to have a conversation, which is deep dive, deep dive with you. I always want to have a conversation with, with other people in Aftermath, like I mentioned before, that I really want to just talk to you. And I think that really just helped me. And we recorded this conversation. Maybe it helped someone else. Yeah. That's essentially yeah. it. Right? Yeah. What, 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 business what, people. Yeah. You know, entrepreneurs. <laughs> entrepreneurs. What should the name be for the podcast? The name be for the, for the podcast? Yeah. Uh, how about, whoa, man. <laughs> 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 hey, that, that was a play on your name. Yeah, yeah. I know. I got it. You got three dad jokes, man. Huh? I know, I do. I have some sick dad jokes. It's pretty amazing. My kids are so proud. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know if you have to figure it out yet, right? Yeah. Maybe you do when you listen to my Apple. Maybe you do. Yeah, yeah. But all right, all right. Hugh, thank you so much, Mark. Maybe we'll do a part <laughs> two someday. Yeah, maybe we'll do a part two someday in a couple of years. Yeah. It'll happen. It'll happen. Yeah. All right, buddy. Yes. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, cheers. Bye. Uh,